Hello and welcome to the 20th episode in our series, The Evolution of a Nation, a documentary series chronicling Uganda's key political, social and economic aspects. I'm Bart Kakoza. In the previous episode, we saw the capture of power by NRM government and the subsequent swearing-in of Museveni as new president. We looked at the initial steps NRM government took to try and revamp the economy. We brought you introduction of popular participatory democracy through resistance council system. We ended the episode with Museveni's effort to form a broad-based government. Now, in this episode, we take a look at the two major challenges that confronted the Museveni government. One, the AIDS pandemic, a new mysterious incurable disease that was ravaging the country. Two, dealing with the remnants of UNLA and the emerging of insurgency, mainly to the north and east of the country. Thanks for joining us. A passing out ceremony for some of the first NRA recruits after NRM took power at Kabamba Military Training School. From the time NRM took power in 1986, one of its major tasks was transition from guerrilla fighters to a national army. The new army would reflect the national character of Uganda and embody the ideals of NRA revolution, which place a lot of emphasis on professionalism and respect for civilians. The philosophy that I am still proud of, of having been, you told of being the first time a commander, is that foundation of the mentality, of the philosophy of our armed forces, of being a pro-people armed forces and respecting the wish of the people. The NRA took a pragmatic approach in dealing with other armed factions which had been fighting the Obote government. Integration of various armed forces became part of its strategy to forge an army that would be representative of the people of Uganda. Those who crossed over with me were assimilated into, integrated into NRA because they were soldiers. So they became, automatically they became NRA. A the, the good uh, man called General Salim Sera, he, he, he called me and Kaira and we negotiated. He said, no, 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 you have to continue with the government. So Kaira was uh, made a minister and uh, I think two others. We joined the, the NRA, one, because our aim in the beginning was not to fight for anything but to bring our people back home. We thought to bring peace in West Nile is to work with the NRA. By mid-1986, UNLA soldiers of the defeated Okelo and Obote government who had fled with their arms through northern Uganda and retreated to South Sudan, crossed back into Uganda at Bibia and renamed themselves UPDA. They launched a new rebellion sweeping across the northern parts of Acholi and put a strain on NRA, which was still trying to consolidate its control over the entire country. The mindset of the population at, time, at that time in the north was that NRA was moving for a war of extermination. Genuinely, many people believed that there were going to be revenge and there was going to be extermination of the, the Acholi people, the Langi people, as a people, as a society. So one, there are those who are in the military who formed UPDA. It was a professional group. They had uh, leaders who were politicians, they had the military officers. But when Museveni came, there was no opposition here. But the problem started when the soldiers started arbitrary arrests of former soldiers. So other soldiers who were not arrested, they said, no, we cannot die as in the time of Amin. Then they took arms and then they started killing the people, the soldiers. 
That is how the war started in northern Uganda. Some of those groupings were expected because like all the groups in which we are formed were from the history uh, of our country. Uh, because some were looking at it at a tribal basis, some were looking at it from their region, some were looking at it from their political backgrounds. And we expected them. And we as said as long as we are cohesive, as long as we are uniting all Ugandans, even these who are in opposition or who are rebels, we will finally, it was his philosophy, it's a philosophy, we finally win them over. You know, Salim Saleh took helicopter, went to them, talked with them, and then they, okay, they agreed that they can uh, come together. So they did the, what they call peace peace accord. After close to two years of attempts to fight their way back during which they lost major battles, in April 1988, the government concluded a peace agreement with the bulk of the UPDA leadership within Uganda. Lieutenant Colonel Angelo Kelo led the UPDA delegation together with Charles Salai, who later was appointed minister in Museven government. As a result of these negotiations, approximately 5,000 UPDA soldiers surrendered and those who were willing to join the army were integrated into the NRA. Because in spite of all the conflicts and, and the uh, casualties which were happening within the operations that were taking place at that point in time, I believe they were quick to understand that, okay, we have been in power as a government, as a military, but there, there has been a shift in the balance of forces. Let's study this. Is what uh, uh, the government and the army, of course, at that time, NRA, what they are saying, is there any truth in it? Because, of course, they were now outreach to them not to keep fighting, that actually NRA was not fighting to exterminate them, but to see how to establish an environment in which the country could get out of the problems in which it was. So they gave, they gave that a chance. Meanwhile, in the eastern part of the country, specifically Teso region, another form of rebellion had sprung up, mainly made up of the elite branch of the defeated UNLA under a new name, Uganda People's Army. The first special forces that Uganda had was predominantly from Teso. About 90% of them were from Teso. So when the government fell in 1986, they believed they had sufficient guns and sufficient manpower to take on the government. And in doing that, they began to reorganize them themselves with those guns. Of course, they were guns that went to the tune of about a thousand plus. They started mobilizing people to give them their sons so that the aspect of leakage by family to say this is where these people are would be difficult because you know you have contributed your son into the rebellion. So everywhere would go and ask where are these people who are starting rebellion? The answer would be Mamanga Jen. It is another so word saying, I don't know. They recruited and trained in Teso, all parts of what you call the Greater Teso. And they were quite a problem. A number of the NRA soldiers lost their lives. They too died. Because in some places they would overrun certain detachments and collect the guns. They knew how to do it. They, they were trained soldiers too. They trained others. In addition, the region was already awash with illicit small arms, mainly in the hands of Karamajon cattle wrestlers, that were raided from Moroto Barracks in 1979, following the fall of Idi Amin's government. Cattle wrestlers took advantage of the security gap created by the subsequent overthrow of the second Milton Obote government. The confusion that ensued before the NRA took over emboldened them to venture and carry out massive cattle raids in eastern and northern Uganda, and Teso bore most of the brands. NRA did not immediately disarm these gunmen, since they were already fighting two insurgencies. When the Karamojong raided Teso freely, 
using the guns they collected from Amore after Min had died, had, had collapsed. Came, entered Teso, and at that time, the Uganda soldiers were extremely few in Teso because most the attention was north. Raided and swept clean here. All these villages they would move. Some of the soldiers who were in Amini's government who had come back and were now at home. And those who ran away from police because everything had collapsed. The police, the prisons from Teso said, let's get, let's organize ourselves and fight the Karamojong. When the Karamojongs had a freeway of moving in the different parts of northern Uganda and eastern Uganda, coming as far as Bugisu Sebe, Palisa, going back to all parts of Teso, and also Lango and some parts of Acholi, this was because we were focused at dealing with the rebellion. Now, we would not fragment a small force. NRA was still a small force, which had just taken power. There was no way we could be able to fragment it to deal with the wrestlers and at the same time deal with the rebellion. Under the command of General J.J. Odong, a new brigade was formed and tasked to counter the rebellion. We did two uh, ways. One is to identify uh, the misled and the misleaders. A misleader who surrenders will treat you as a person who has reformed and would give you a chance to integrate either to our forces or a chance to integrate back to the society. But those ones who remain persistent and resistant with the hope that they will eventually over overthrow the government, those ones ended up in prison and they served some sentence in the prison and eventually they came out when the rebellion was no longer a force that was reckonable to. So they gave up. In 1987, the president appointed a team of eminent persons heading from the region to the Presidential Commission for Teso. The commission was charged with the responsibility of engaging the population in Teso so as to understand the reason why the rebellion had erupted and was gaining root. They extensively consulted and their work was one of the contributing initiatives to the end of the rebellion. The government of the day has attempted to do quite a lot to mitigate the situation. There is stalking exercise had to be systematic, not just random, no. If you say you lost 50 cows, what evidence do you have on that? So, some people wanted to take advantage of that, and just tell lies. And so the government of the day has, to be, has had to be very, very, very cautious in doing this. But some people have got to, have been compensated financially for the number of cows they lost. So not everybody has received it. So if there was the honesty, as you would expect in this, I think it would have moved faster. And at that point in time also, we had another serious uh, force, a combined mobile force, calling itself Holy Spirit Mobile Forces of Alice Lakwena, which also came and went through Teso. Alice Lakwena, a self-styled prophetess from Gulu, had wooed some of the commanders of the UPDA who did not embrace the amnesty by promising them spiritual protection in waging a new rebellion and is a victory against the NRM government. She named our fighters the Alice Lakwena Holy Spirit Mobile Forces. When the NRA defeated uh, the UNLA, they, they formed the UPDA and Alice Lakwena took advantage because of a uh, notion that she has heavenly powers. That's why she was calling her forces Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit forces, and Holy Spirit mobile forces. With me, I'm a prophet. I was treating a lot of people. 
And by that time, when Museveni took over, they found that I'm colorless, like when. And I met the government. By the time I prophet, the spirit prophet to them that if they go in Gulu, Kitgum, Old Vaya, Northern, and West Nile, they will find no war. With that uh, superstition, which was so much high in northern part of the country, Alice Lakwena was able to recruit former commanders like uh, uh, Kilama, who was a brigade commander. Then uh, uh, there was another very serious brigade commander, uh, Eric Odua, and uh, those formed a serious mobile uh, forces that were able to recruit all the former forces. Lakwena wasn't, she, didn't, she wasn't an officer of an army, she hadn't been trained in any way, but she tapped into the fear that there was. Unfortunately, used the methods of fighting which were absolutely unconventional. I mean, they were a mixture of so many things, including emotions and spirituality and all that, which led to a lot of unnecessary casualties on the force which she was leading, the Holy Spirit, you know, lost so many people. Because, you see, you cannot uh, command people to charge an entrenched force with heavy machine guns, with anti-aircraft weapons, with uh, all forms of weapons, and you charge, you know? And that's what they were doing almost all the time. When they came, they would be singing, singing and clapping, and then the soldiers would go in the, in the trenches and firing gun, but not seeing where the gun, the bullet is going. But those people would be courageously running straight to them, and then with the stone, and then find somebody there, hit the, the head and pick the gun. So that's how they, get, they got the guns. And they moved from here to Lango, from Lango to Soroti, Soroti to Busoga. And they made quite a serious advancement, which advancement uh, made them to come the whole way fighting with us up to Busoga. Their, their, their last, last battles was when they attempted Magamaga uh, barracks, and then we, we went and defeated them in a Gairo. But Alice Lakwena was lucky that she split her force and remained in hiding in the forest of uh, uh, Mpologoma, that Mpologoma river that divides Busoga and, uh, uh, and uh, Bunyoli. She crossed back using the canoe and eventually crossed to Kenya, where eventually she ended up in the Kaukuma refugee camp and eventually succumbed to natural diseases. It remains a mystery as to how an ex-local brew sailor was able to recruit not only seasoned military commanders, but also highly trained professionals into her ranks and convince them to trust magical rituals against military firepower. The one which will uh, intrigue you more was Prof Pro Professor Isaac Newton Ojok whom I had a lot of respect and I knew was the Minister of Education in this country. I asked Professor Isaac Newton Ojok when we captured him and said, the Professor, how do you bring all these forces from the northern part of the country up to Igeiro in Busoga? Then he told me that, my son, this whole spirit is true and it is working. Then I challenged him, I said, Professor, this is some of the the arsenals that we captured from your forces they were stones but blended with some smear of the cyanide oil then he told me yes those are the, the stones that can explode like grenades so I said can you demonstrate for me then he told me my son you have already touched these stones you have contaminated them we shall need Mama Alice Lakwena to cleanse them so I was at a loss if the professor got to believe that. Then it meant there are so many people they could mislead in that uh, venture which was really empty. Then I asked him that why do you people allow Alice Lakwena to smear 
uh, their fighters with sheer nata, sheer, sheer oil butter. And he told me that yes, as soon as she mirrors you with that, if you don't go against any of the rules she gives, then you do not die. You will be able to go and fight, and uh, that oil is like bulletproof. Then I put it to him, I said, Professor, did you put anybody on a range and you fired and saw that it doesn't kill? He said, no, you don't test the whole spirit. The whole spirit had given us that clearance. I told but Professor, most of the, your fighters who came to the battlefield, they, they got killed. He said, then they must have gone against the rules of Alice Lakwena, of the whole spirit. But the members whom we also arrested said, they had been told, even if you die, don't get the rest of our life, not get to despair, because as soon as we reach the source of the Nile, we shall dip our hands in the river Nile, and anybody who had passed on, who had been killed, will come out of the water with, the, with this decoration. The rank that you come up with is the one we shall recognize. It was just a matter of getting decorated, you cross the, the Nile Bridge, then Hornfels Bridge, and you'd be able to go to, to the, the power of, of the state. I'm going to go to After this devastating defeat, the remnants retreated back to Gulu, where they found solace in a bizarre religious sect headed by this man called Saverino Lokoya, Alice Lakwena's father. He operated a shrine that practiced mystical spiritual rituals that blended Christianity with witchcraft, a kind of continuation of his daughter's legacy. Lukoya was unable to galvanize them to return to the battlefield. Eventually, the group fizzled out. We went to Agoro our place there. And I was saying, you know, there is a mountain, big mountains called Langia. Said, look, look people, it is me who made this mountain. Don't the people realize it straight away that this is a madman. So they, they wanted to lynch him, to kill him. So he had to run. Meanwhile, groups opposed NRM in Uganda but more so in eastern Uganda, attempted to mobilize against the new government. But their call to armed rebellion did not gain momentum. Many of their members were arrested and charged for treason, while those of Fosso brought back again, Foba, gave up. We just realized that why should our people suffer when the problems are in Kampala? Yeah. So, so it just fizzles out and we said, no, let's work with the man. Country first, person later. Because the longer you fight, the more you do damage to the country. So eventually we agreed, said, enough is enough, let's work together. If we're going to continue opposition, let it be in parliament, organized under democratic rules. But the guns should never be a means of solving a political equation. Besides dealing with the military insurgencies in the north and the east, the central part of the country were being ravaged by the new pandemic, HIV and AIDS. The pandemic found fertile ground in a collapsed health system and was spreading across the country like a bushfire. In 1981, a young medical officer called Regaba made a very smart observation in terms of public health. He was a medical officer in Rakai. He reported, young men are dying of a mysterious disease, young men of a sexually active age, 20 to 30 to 40, young men and women are dying. They are dying emaciated, they are dying with the TB, they are dying bone, bare bones. And that's how the disease slim came up. Government realized early enough the danger HIV posed at the time when the country was just emerging out of the civil war. There is need for absolute political commitment at the highest level so that the political commitment is able to guide and tell the people about the disease and give them right information. 
And secondly, the need for a partnership. This called for an immediate plan to salvage the situation. Owing to the magnitude of the problem, the traditional insurance systems, such as extended families, are becoming overstretched and can no longer be expected to cope without external assistance. Rugunda makes an SOS. He says, no, we have a problem. People are dying. We need help. He calls in WHO, calls in uh, uh, MRC, the Medical Research Council of Britain, and it was like uh, it, it was like uh, he had opened a can of worms, because then all of a sudden the world opened up. They said, "Oh, we have a problem. We have a pandemic. We have a disease that of of immense proportions." In the African villages, once a lion comes to attack the village, we make alarm, very loud alarm. So the whole village comes and fight the lion. That's what we did with AIDS. The next course of action was the establishment of the Uganda AIDS Control Program within the Ministry of Health. Coupled with the government policy of openness in confronting the pandemic, the multi-pronged strategy generated financial resources and mobilized the global community to take action. Under the director of Quarry, and I became the first epidemiologist uh, investigating the disease and distribution of disease. And we got a lot of support from the world, the multilaterals, the bilaterals, the, and we formed a formidable program. We used the basic knowledge of disease control. Where is the disease? In which population is it? How big is the disease? What is the transmission? What is the cause of transmission? What can we do about it? From the onset, prevention of infections among the sexually active adult population was the cardinal concern of the Uganda government. The foundation for this was laid in 1987 and instituted in the ABC strategy. Abstinence, focusing on young people, being faithful to your partner when in marriage, and use of condoms consistently when the two fail. In the next episode, we take a closer look at how HIV and AIDS devastated the country and how Uganda took the lead in devising means of containing the pandemic. Thanks for being part of our wider audience. See you next time.